Um, I'm really happy that um, this morning we can welcome for our keynote speak, speaker, someone who really is exemplifying the solidarity um, that Jimmy has, has so rightly suggested we need. You mentioned that vets and, vets and medics don't always work that well together. And we're now going to hear from a veterinarian who is working in a medical institution um, and developing vaccines which are appropriate for use across that divide in both livestock and humans. Professor, Professor George Warimwe Wei is a, a veterinarian who is the, a PI at the Kemri Wellcome Trust Unit here in, in Kalifi and is a prof assistant professor in the Center for Tropical Medicine and Global Health at the University of Oxford. Um, he has just been um, awarded an incredible prize by the Royal Society, the Royal Society Africa Prize, for his work on viral zoonoses. And he's going to talk to us today, today about his experience as um, uh, someone who crosses these boundaries and the development of a Rift Valley fever vaccine suitable for use in humans and livestock. So with that, I would like to pass across um, to Professor George Wurimwe, and um, we're really looking forward to hearing from you today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Leanne. And th I'd like to first start by thanking all the organizers for this uh, fantastic conference. Uh, I mean, One Health has been on the fringes for a very long time, but uh, it's now sort of center stage, and this is our opportunity to really push this um, uh, agenda that really makes sense in terms of disease control. So um, I really like, you know, following Jimmy Smith's uh, talk, I mean, that's, that's going to be a tough act, but there are some things that he mentioned about siloed thinking and uh, in all the sort of different facets that uh, we deal with, with in health. And, you know, my, my view of One Health in this space of vaccinology is looking at developing vaccines for humans through the lens of animal health and vice versa. So if you're developing vaccines for veterinary, you know, for veterinary use, looking at the, um, the impact of those vaccines and the development process from a, from a human perspective. So um, I'm going to talk about a program that I've been working on for a while now. So this started sometime in 2012, which, which tells you about the, the sort of scale of time that you need to develop uh, vaccines and, and also speaks to the sort of rapid development of COVID vaccines that we have seen, because that has been shrunk down to about 100 days. So it's about developing a single vaccine for use in um, humans and livestock against Rift Valley fever. This audience, I don't think I need to talk about um, Sorry, myself. Okay, I don't think I need to talk about the the importance of animals to uh, to human health for this particular audience. In fact, this this is a photo taken uh, uh, among a collection of lots of photos on the Ilri flicker site. So I would urge you all to look it, to look at that. It's got fantastic. Um, visual uh, representations of the importance of animal health to humans. And I like this photo because it just demonstrates the pure joy that animals bring to, to humans, especially children. But of course, we also know about the, the economic importance, the, you know, there's been lots of studies demonstrating the uh, impact of life, uh, you know, animals to livelihoods, financial security. I always mention that I, I was any, only able to go to university because my grandparents who raised me own an animal and they saw that animal and that uh, generated income you know, some, some funding for me to go to university. And I'm sure there are many others in the audience who have uh, similar stories. But one of the other things we share with uh, livestock are infectious diseases. In fact, over 60% of infectious diseases are, in humans have uh, involved an animal uh, sort of transmission. And uh, for the emerging infectious diseases that we're seeing now that, you know, that are increasing in incidence, that percentage is much higher. So um, when you're thinking about controlling human disease, it, it, it just illustrates the point that you also have to think about uh, animal health just because of that uh, uh, connection. 
Um, so I'm going to talk about Rift Valley Fever, which is a virus that was identified in Kenya in uh, the 1930s. It is an RNA virus in the family Fenuviridae. Um, there are no vaccines available for it or no specific therapeutics, uh, which is why it has been prioritized by the African Union and the World Health Organization. So um, RVF is, is, has a complex transmission cycle uh, by complexity, meaning that, you know, for me, it involves quite a lot of uh, mammalian species and lots of um, mosquito species. So, but the simplistic sort of explanation is that you have very heavy rainfall that causes floods, which increases uh, the number of mosquitoes um, to, to transmit the virus. Sorry, um, so able to, to uh, transmit the virus. This um, increase in mosquito numbers uh, allows a mechanism for the virus to circulate in, in animals. Some of the mosquitoes are infected you know, for life. The eggs are, you know, the, if they had had a blood meal uh, that has infectious virus, the virus has um, you know, gone through its progeny through the eggs. Uh, and so the virus transmits, uh, I mean, the mosquitoes transmit the virus uh, in animal species, most commonly sheep, goats, cattle, and camels. And during these epidemics where, where you have very high levels of viremia, uh, viral load circulating in these animals, uh, the viruses can then, the mosquitoes can then transmit the virus to humans uh, or also to wildlife. Now, the virus um, sort of has been detected in wildlife by way of sero seroprevalence studies, but the impact of RVF in, in livestock is really not uh, fully understood. But in domestic ruminants, like you know the ones I've mentioned, you, you get the, uh, up to about adult animals, and of course, in young animals, the mortality is much higher. This is over ninety percent, and you know the classic, uh, the classic sort of hallmark of disease is uh, abortion storm. So nearly all animals in a farm that are pregnant would abort. In humans, the disease um, is described more like a um, flu-like illness with very non-specific symptoms, but a proportion of these individuals develop severe disease with high case fatality rates. And, and it, it, there's been some sort of uh, evidence, uh, although anecdotal, suggesting that the case fatality has been, you know, of recent uh, epidemics in humans uh, has been rather high. So ranging from about 30%, at least for from the East African uh, uh, outbreaks. So where is RVF common? It's predominantly in Africa. And um, these maps, you know, are like you would have seen maps like this for all sorts of things. Basically, the darker it is, the, the more uh, cases there are or have been reported. Uh, on the left, you've got humans. On the right, you have livestock. The most important thing here to note is that there is a lot more um, cases of RVF reported in livestock uh, than in humans, which possibly just illustrates the, the poor sort of surveillance systems in, in humans in some of these settings. Uh, the other thing you will note, if, you will note is that uh, Kenya and South Africa or East Africa and Southern Africa tend to be really severely affected by RVF outbreaks just based on the number over the previous years. So what can we do to control RVF? Uh, we have licensed uh, inactivated uh, vac and live vaccines for their use in, in livestock. Uh, these have some safety drawbacks and uh, some need multiple doses to uh, generate an effective immune response. You need high containment for their production because it's an actual sort of RVF virus that you're dealing with, whether inactivating it or modified in some way. Um, and it's not, they're not DIVA compatible. So you cannot differentiate uh, vaccinated animals from um, non-vaccinated animals because the antibody response to the whole virus is similar to that that's caused by natural infection. So there are no licensed vaccines for human use. And so the, the, the thrust of this program has really been about developing a vaccine for, for human use, but also developing safer uh, vaccines that can be used in livestock. This is a very old um, uh, table from the 1930s. Just uh, all I want to demonstrate here is that uh, 
a, a humor or immune response or so an antibody response is sufficient for protection uh, because of time I, I won't really go into the table but the, but you, you the point I want to sort of make is that if you pass into animals, again, you can confer protection, uh, suggesting that antibodies are important. We also have from very many studies that have been done over the years, demonstrating that neutralizing antibodies uh, correlate with protection. And so if you're thinking about a target for a vaccine uh, you know, construct, you want to develop antibodies, you know, develop a vaccine that can elicit neutralizing antibodies. And we finally, we know that uh, if you recover from RVF infection, then these neutralizing antibodies tend to be long-lived. And this is just a, a case demonstrating that uh, an individual had neutralizing antibodies up to 25 years later without um, uh, exposure in the intervening period, which is uh, really remarkable. So we know what the, the target of these neutralizing antibodies are. It's the surface of the viral glycoprotein of the, of the virus. Now, these are viral glycoproteins known as GN and GC. Uh, the, the, the analogous uh, sort of situation here is the spike protein for coronavirus. So it's like targeting the same sort of surface of the virus. It's an enveloped RNA uh, virus. So we set out to use the Chadox-1 platform uh, because at that time, the Chadox-1 uh, vaccine platform, which is basically just a vehicle to deliver the vaccine, had been used in humans and uh, had been shown to be safe in humans. This is very important as a, as a sort of starting point for a human vaccine because you've already uh, saved so much costs by having uh, already a track record in, in the safety profile. Uh, you will, uh, I will talk about the costs of developing vaccines later. But the Chadox-1 platform uh, was safe in humans uh, previously when used for other vaccines. And all we did basically is get the targets, the, the genes that encode the virus uh, RVF, GN, and GC, and uh, you, you know, inserted this into the Chadox-1 uh, vector, which when, in, when you vaccinate an individual, gets into the cell, uh, expresses the, the proteins, and these uh, RVF glycoproteins then uh, stimulate an immune response, and hopefully you've got a very high immune response to confer protection. So the methods of manufacture were already well established, so it really was a, a matter of plug and play. So this image just illustrates the, um, the, the sort of uh, pipeline for development. It's, it's simplistic, uh, but it just illustrates the point. We've had the preclinical uh, discovery period where we identified the RVF, I mean, inserted the RVF, GN, and GC into the Chadox-1 platform. Uh, the plan was to do preclinical studies in mice uh, and then go on to livestock trials and, and human studies. And, and if you know, hopefully, if it all works well, then you'd have a single vaccine uh, for using multiple species. So um, the first uh, really encouraging data we found was that uh, if you immunize mice and expose them to RVF virus uh, two months later, uh, you had 100% protection. And, um, the, you know, this was very exciting, whereas the group that uh, were given a placebo uh, did not, uh, you know, were not protected and succumbed to infection. So the next sets of uh, studies in, in livestock were studies that we did um, in very close partnership uh, with ILRI, uh, with Vishnene and others. And the idea here was to immunize animals and following, um, follow them up for a month for immune response to, to develop and then expose them to RVF virus. So this is a typical approach of evaluating vaccines. So the long and short of it was that a single immunization uh, in all those species provided 100% protection. So none of the animals that received Chadox-1 um, developed disease. And in fact, as illustrated on this on this plot, the with the blue representing Chadox One group and the black representing the licensed product and the uh, gray representing placebo, all the Chadox One vaccinated animals mounted a neutralizing antibody response. 
uh, for the Rift Vax, which is available in Kenya as a you know RVF vaccine. Uh, two of the animals, one in you know cattle and and goats, did not mount a neutralizing response and were not protected. Further supporting this idea that. Um, neutralizing antibodies are the main sort of thing you need to elicit to uh, mount an immune response. So the publication is up there if anybody wants to, to follow that. So uh, the next step was to look at uh, RVF in pregnancy, again using a similar uh, ex experimental design where you vaccinate. Uh, for this, we vaccinated early in gestation and challenged them later with a, with, a, with a virulent virus and then monitoring the safety of the fetus and also uh, protection. So these studies were done in the Netherlands with uh, 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 Jerome Kotekas and others. Um, and the top uh, panels represent the results of the vaccine development in, in sheep. Um, and the bottom are the goats. So the both, I mean, in both species, the, the antibody response was uh, really very high. It was within the range we observed in the Kenyan study uh, artillery. Um, and and uh, the, the Chadox-1 vaccinated group in red here were, um, were protected against uh, viremia. So you see the viral load there. It just means that the animals were protected against um, you know, RVF infection. There was no illness in the pregnant uh, animals um, and no sign of infection in the fetuses in, in sheep. Um, in the goats, again, we, got, we had very high levels of uh, protection, although two of the 25 uh, fetuses uh, succumbed to infection, suggesting that there might be uh, differences in the uh, either the mechanism of protection or, or other factor in, in goats in terms of uh, uh, the level of protection that you see following vaccination. But the primary aim of this uh, experiment really was to demonstrate that the Chadox-1 vaccine was safe, which is something that current, uh, you know, most of the vaccines currently uh, are unable to, you know, show, you know, that we, we really don't have any vaccines that can be used in pregnancy other than uh, the inactivated versions that need uh, multiple immunizations. So this was a really um, good point to sort of uh, get that, you know, proceed from. Uh, yeah, so uh, the next step was to look at the now that we've demonstrated the um, the safety of the product in uh, in pregnant and non-pregnant animals and showed the, you know very high levels of protection, we the next step was to conduct a, a field trial, looking at the um, uh, whether the vaccine elicits uh, a similar you know performs as well as the licensed product in a study that is powered to evaluate that at a sort of uh, a population level. So the previous studies were designed to look at efficacy, uh, you know, for the first study, and the, the second one was to look at safety in pregnancy, whereas this is now looking at a field level. And these are studies that we did in uh, Kapiti, where we um, looked at 100, uh, 180 animals per species. So this is with the, as, as indicated there, there was a study protocol. And this study was done to very high levels, very high standards, so uh, to GCP. Uh, and I believe it's probably the largest uh, sort of GCP veterinary trial that's been done globally. Uh, I haven't had anybody object to that in the different places I've, I've talked about this. Um, so uh, as I say, the study is done in Kenya, it's, it's in healthy and pregnant animals and the animals were followed up for a year. And the end point of the trial, the, the thing that we will use to say whether the vaccine performs as well as a licensed product is a neutralizing antibody titers. Now, I don't have the results for this, but um, analysis is underway, uh, but should be available sometime early next year. But the whole point is that this data will be used to support the registration of the product for use in East Africa and other, and other countries uh, in Africa where there is very high uh, sort of exposure to RVF. So I'll switch gears a bit. So now we're moving to humans. So the, the veterinary development is of course very advanced. Uh, and we are now you know, at the point where we're thinking about registration. But how about the human study? So we began a phase one study uh, in humans in Oxford. And this is uh, the typical 
uh, approach is to start with a low dose, go to a medium dose and a high dose. For any of you who've been following, uh, you know, the Oxford AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine development, you would have seen some of these sort of experimental designs uh, or trial designs very early on. So this, this sort of phase one study is, is done in a small number of participants with the aim of just looking at the safety profile of the product. And of course, whether it also elicits an immune response, the desired immune response. So we already have for the platform in general, so Chadox One in general, we already have over safety database over a billion doses, of course, because of the Oxford AstraZeneca COVID vaccine. But now we want to add data specific to the RVF vaccine. And so far, the vaccine is performing well, both in terms of the safety uh, and, and the immune response. And again, we expect this data to be ready you know, for sort of dissemination uh, sometime early next year. So I've, I've taken that fairly quickly just because of time, but the, but the summary of this work is that, uh, you know, we've uh, identified very high levels of protection in livestock. Uh, the vaccine is highly uh, efficacious and safe in pregnant uh, ruminants. Uh, and the safety and immunogenicity is expected to be as good as current licensed vaccine, which is the sort of the smith band vaccine supplied by uh, Kevevapi analysis is ongoing, as is the analysis of the human phase one study uh, that uh, is going to be available as from next year. So in terms of, so for the veterinary uh, development, the veterinary use of the product, um, that has a clear sort of pathway um, that we would follow for the, um, as stipulated by uh, the local regulators um, and, you know, NBA, the, the Veterinary Medicines Directorate, and, and sort of, and there is a actually a harmonized process for, for doing this in Eastern Africa. But how about the, the human landscape? Now, one of the most difficult things to do, as, as you know, the audience might appreciate, is to predict when the next um, Rift Valley fever outbreak would be. If you, if, if you are to predict that with very high sort of confidence, you would be able to design uh, a vaccine efficacy study. So, um, but in the absence of that, it becomes really difficult to predict, uh, you know, to design a, a vaccine efficacy study for you for uh, RVF. So an alternative approach would be to uh, use uh, correlates of protection as done for other vaccines. So we know, you know, the threshold, the antibody threshold you require to provide protection against rabies, for instance, and even yellow fever, for instance. Um, another, another route is to think about an animal rule, which is something that's done by the FDA in the US. But uh, because this is a problem, RVF is a problem that's predominantly restricted to Africa and the Arabian Peninsula. I think we think that there is a need to engage the regulatory um, uh, national regulatory authorities in the continent about the, the best sort of strategy towards licensure of this vaccine, whether it's uh, emergency use authorization, as we have seen, as we have seen for uh, COVID-19, uh, and then followed by sort of a, 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 um, a phase three study where you're looking at uh, efficacy evaluation if ever there was a massive uh, sort of epidemic. You also need to think about what vaccination regimen uh, is going to be eventually used. And so this relies on doing um, uh, further studies, phase two studies, where you look at uh, uh, a single dose versus two doses and, and uh, which of those performs well, and think about the deployment and how would you deploy this vaccine? Would you deploy it in humans only, or would you deploy it in humans and animals during an epidemic? And, you know, this sort of thing calls for, uh, you know, massive stakeholder engagement, including the bodies listed there. So very much a One Health focused sort of uh, um, strategy strategy also, not just the, in the making of the vaccine and, and the planning of the experiment, but also in the future work on the deployment of, of the product. So I think uh, we'll stop there. Um, sorry. Yeah, I'll stop there and just acknowledge that this is work that is involved um, very many partners and uh, at the center of this has been the International Livestock Research Institute, very close partners there, uh, as I mentioned earlier, but also I can just or not I cannot overstate the importance of uh, engagement with the 
um, regulatory and policy stakeholders, including the National Biosafety Authority and the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock and Fisheries, because this would not have been possible without their support um, and you know and and guidance through the through the process uh, at Ilri, uh, you know, Campus and Kapiti. So I think I'll stop there and uh, hand it over back to you, Leanne, or, or um, for any uh, other questions. Thank you so much, George, for that great, great talk. Um, and uh, there's lots of questions in the chat, um, but I'm going to just jump in uh, with one that's maybe a little bit less technical. We talked a bit at the beginning about the, the difficulty of breaking down silos. So I'm gonna ask you a personal question. Um, as as a, a veterinarian um, now working at Kemri, how, how have you felt how have you found that transition sort of moving from the veterinary field into um, sort of medical research? How have, and have you got any um, suggestions for those of us here or online about talking across disciplines and making those, forging those connections? Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think um, the, the first thing to say is I, is I never left veterinary medicine. My background is I'm a vet, as you said, and I think the the uh, I have sort of um, enthused colleagues at Camry and and others you know that I collaborate with uh, globally about the value of uh, animal health, not just from the perspective of you know at, at the public you know deployment. Because when you think of one health, there, there is a there's a big sort of bias, I think, towards thinking of control programs, like a, a con you're deploying a control program for brucellosis and you have to think about both. But I think I've been accusing people to think about more even at the basic level that there are difference in, differences in uh, animals and humans in terms of the uh, immune, sort of the way they mount an immune response, the components of the immune response. So you can understand pathogens and and how you know to con how to control pathogens uh, by looking at how the host paras you know host parasite or host virus interaction differs in the different species so it's been more about showing a different way of thinking about the particular problem that uh, you know colleagues are working on uh, and applying this sort of one health um, basically exploiting synergies in in uh, in sort of immunology in both humans and, and livestock it's not necessarily easy but it, it to me it just makes sense yeah no that that's wonderful and very sort of reminiscent of that original one medicine um, concept and and also very great to hear that you never feel that you've left veterinary medicine I'm sorry if that was what came across I always have uh, have this myself where people said oh you're in research maybe you're not a vet anymore but we're still we're still veterinarians at heart um, so I'm just going to pick up on a couple of questions that came in the chat um, so uh, there was one question that uh, suggested that given the um, the prolonged drought followed by um, very heavy rains that we've experienced in the country, you know, does this make you feel that an outbreak might be more likely? And if so, is there anything people should be considering to protect themselves or protect, prepare? Yeah, I mean, I think that's again is a, is a good question. Um, there are others in the audience, you know, Bernard Bett and others who can make a, a really informed decision based on the sort of mathematical modeling and predictions. I think I will, I would emphasize more uh, rather than moving, rather than thinking about, you know, is there an outbreak that's going to happen because of these uh, conditions? I think I would emphasize being ready all the time, which is uh, something that uh, Jimmy mentioned in, in his uh, sort of introduc introdu introduction, that we need to be ready. We need to have surveillance systems that are ready to sort of uh, go uh, without necessarily um, sort of having to wait for a set of circumstances to come to come into sort of existence. So you can always, if we have surveillance systems that are full, you know, that are not just focused on a particular disease, not just focused on RVF, then you will be able to respond quickly um, regardless of whether there's a drought or whether there is not. I think I would emphasize more on having um, uh, that of, you know, everyday sort of readiness to address sort of uh, outbreaks. I don't know whether I'm making sense there. 
rather yes. than focusing more just on an RVF outbreak. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's really clear that we really need to put um, our, our efforts into preparedness and surveillance. Um, 